Good morning. Thank you for joining me for another five good minutes with the Word. I'm Barry Bryson, and we're continuing our study of the book of Ecclesiastes, and we're going to finish uh, chapter 11 and go into chapter 12 today. Uh, the section that begins in chapter 11, verse 9, um, begin, it, that begins the section that is addressed to the young man. Um, uh, and it's, it's interesting to, to ask ourselves which young man is he speaking of. And, I, you know, young men in general, but I, I, think, I think there's a sense in which he's speaking to his younger self. Uh, let's not forget that Ecclesiastes represents a lifetime of work. Um, uh, he, he has conducted his life as an experiment and, um, and as we've noticed uh, throughout the book there's a, there's a real sense at times that he squandered so many resources, so much time uh, pursuing um, avenues that were not satisfying at all and so to the young man means to any young man but I, I think he's kind of looking back and speaking to his younger self. This passage is perhaps the best known of all the passages, with the possible exception of the poem in chapter 3, and it reminds us uh, what we've been saying all along, that as melancholy as this book is, the language is as beautiful as any any human being ever ever wrote, and, or, or that the Holy Spirit ever inspired. Um, so let's read chapter 11, beginning with verse 9, and we're going to go through uh, chapter 12 uh, all the way to uh, verse uh, 8. Okay. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these things God will bring you into judgment. Remove vexation from your heart and put away pain from your body, for youth and the dawn of life are vanity. Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come <clears throat> and the years draw near, of which we, you, you will say, I have no pleasure in them, before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain, in the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because they are few and those who look through the windows are dimmed and the doors on the street are shut when the sound of the grinding is low and one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of song are brought low. They are afraid also of what is high and terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along, and desire fails because man is going to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the streets. Before the silver cord is snapped, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. We begin with the address to the young men, to the young man, and then we end this passage, this section, with the last repetition of his uh, primary uh, hypothesis that everything in life is just emptiness. He begins by saying, "Be happy, young man," and I want, I want to say to him, "Thanks a lot. You've just, you've just taken up eleven chapters of the of the Word of God, depressing us." And now you're telling us to be happy. But, but he really means this, and he's repeating a theme that, that, this is the fourth time I believe he's repeated this theme, that you should enjoy the blessings of God as you experience them, because they are gifts from God. And youth is one of these gifts, which he makes clear, because even though this is addressed to the young man, it is a meditation, the, the, the largest section of it is a meditation on age. And, and so he's telling the young man, enjoy your youth, but never lose the consciousness that this is passing away, that this is fleeting, this is impermanent, that this is ultimately going to be something that you cannot keep. That's why he calls it a vanity. Um, and, um, and then he enters into 
into this uh, conversation or this meditation, I should say, about about um, and gives us this long poem about age, and and it's so well known and so well loved, and the the, the beauty of it is just haunting. It's all in metaphor. It's all in image. Some of these seem to be fairly obvious, but some of them not so much. I just made a list of the different things that I read in just three or four commentaries of what they think he's talking about. He's describing, I, I've got this list, describing the lo loss of eyesight, depression, trembling hands, um, you know, stooping, uh, spinal cord damage, losing your teeth, cataracts, losing your hearing, loss of sleep, or no longer having a desire to sleep, losing all your, of your appetites, declining mental power, uh, loss of bladder control, heart failure, and on and on and on. Yes, all of the above. He's describing in a way that really transcends language, in a way that in which he doesn't use vocabulary words, but word pictures um, that are metaphorical to, and we get it. We just get it, just to communicate what it's like to, to, to feel that sense of decay, and I, you know, I, it spoke to me as a young man, and now that you know I'm I'm in my 60s, uh, and I'm in and in the middle of experiencing all that, it's it, it just it is even more true, and it, it's an amazing thing, it's a miraculous thing the way, using these word pictures, he really creates an experience for a young person what it's like to feel the decay of age and to realize that everything that we have here is impermanent. There's nothing here that we can, we can hold on to that belongs to this place and this physical body. That's why he reiterates vanity of vanities. But did you catch the entrance of eternity? He mentioned it at the beginning of the passage and then twice towards the end. He said, but know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. What does judgment even mean if there isn't reward or punishment? If, if once we die, we cease to exist, then judgment is meaningless. And so judgment requires an eternity, or at least an existence beyond death. And then he talks about man going to his eternal home, right? And in verse 5, and then... In verse 7, he talks about the Spirit returning to God who gave it. So, yes. And know from the very beginning, know from the time of your youth, that this isn't all there is. That there is eternity. There will be judgment. And we will have an eternal home. And our spirit will survive the death of our physical body and will return to God who gave it to us in the first place. Um one um, comes to believe, at least this reader does, that he, he was listening and was reading the things that his father uh, wrote and taught, especially in places like Psalm 139, uh, 127, that we come from God, that God formed us, and that when, when, when this earthly carcass is, is no longer uh, our abode, uh, that eternal part of us will return to God, to return to God who gave it. I just want to leave, and I know I've taken up nearly 10 minutes of your time, that image of the silver cord snapped and the golden bowl broken, and the, the images of a silver chain uh, hanging from the ceiling holding a bowl that is itself a lamp. And so you maybe have wicks or you have an oil, but it's a reservoir, right? It was made of gold. Uh, the, 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 the cord is silver because silver is much stronger than gold. A gold chain could not have held up a, a silver, you know, bowl full of oil or wax or something for very long. I mean, it would be, it would, but the silver one could, but then the silver one breaks and the whole thing, the lighted candle, the reservoir crashes to the ground and breaks to pieces and everything goes out. It's such a vivid image of, 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 a, of a life coming, coming to an end. Well, we are left with the conclusion, and we'll pick up with verse 9 next time. Thank you for joining me for another 5 Good Minutes with the Word.